Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This Pastures in Practice webinar series is an initiative of the Ag Services team of Local Land Services. It kicked off in response to feedback we received from landholders who attended the Pastures Research Update held back in March. And we aim to share knowledge and engage in healthy discussions around topical issues on all things pastures. Uh, Basil, our guest speaker, is a livestock consultant working with beef and sheep producers who has a background in ag science and economics. Uh, after Basil's presentation, when we get to the Q&A session, after Basil has spoken, you'll see a little question mark up in the top right window. So please click on the Q&A box and type your questions. All of the participants who've joined us are actually anonymous tonight. So if you'd like to start off by saying what your locality is or what type of autumn you've actually been experiencing, um, you're more than welcome. It will help um, put the question in context, um, but we won't see who you are. So that's just part of the team's uh, program that we're running the webinar under tonight. Uh, Basil will address each question one at a time in order that they come in. And we welcome you tonight, Basil, over to you. Thank you. Basil, you're just on mute. Can Basil unmute himself? Do you need to do something here? Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, well, thanks very much, um, Lisa. Yeah, so just uh, tonight I've been giving, given a, a series of areas around uh, nitrogen and gibberellic acid to address from a boosting um, pasture production perspective. Um, so just in terms of an outline of what I'll go through is um, just uh, as a starting point, putting them in, in context in terms of their importance around uh, the production system, what they are and what they do, um, what we can expect in terms of dry matter production and, and how best to use that, um, withholding periods or rest periods, looking at any impact on clover, um, some environmental and seasonal considerations, um, some likely returns, although you know that'll be fairly rough, um, uh, given that each farm will, will have its own um, specific scenario to work through. Um, and I think the other thing is to look at um, alternatives um, to gib acid and nitrogen um, or competing resources. So, just in terms of a systems context, I think at um, a strategic level or a whole of systems level, like there could well be better spend. So I look at these two options as tools. Um, firstly, um, I'm not going to promote their use. I, I just think they sit in a toolbox and we can have an opportunity to, to use them. But second to that, they, they also compete for resources within the, the farm business. Um, so there could well be better spend. So I've seen plenty of farm businesses get into situations where they have large spends on nitrogen each year, basically to buy themselves out of out of trouble, uh, and that soaks up a lot of capital that um, could well be deployed elsewhere. So I think things like um, soil pH, soil fertility, pasture improvement, investment in infrastructure, uh, investment in weeds and pest management and genetics probably all have a better return um, because you spend a dollar now and you'll get that return over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, whereas the the investment in nitrogen is to basically spend a dollar now and hope to get more than a dollar back in pretty near future. Um, so, so I think that needs to be borne in mind. I think secondly, if we drop down to a tactical level, um, most common use uh, with clients is, is a, at that level of trying to drive midwinter stocking rate. Um, we know that Annual average stocking rates, absolutely key driver of profitability, uh, but midwinter stocking rate is a key driver of average annual stocking rate. So, so we're using it to try and drive a whole of systems response, um, but in the short term, get an economic return as well. 
at an operational level, um, which is where most people tend to, to focus, I often see it used as a tool for buying your way out of trouble, which anything you do to buy your way out of a lot of trouble has a, a very high return. But unfortunately, if you didn't need to be in that problem, in that trouble in the first place, it has a very low return. So there's two extremes there. Um, if it can be used to increase rate of turn off or turn off terminal weights, um, the fixed cost of maintaining the app animal is, is already there, so we have a high marginal return. Um, and if we can achieve key live weight targets, particularly in, in sheep enterprises, then it, then it also has a, a, a very high um, marginal return. I think the, the first point there, the irony of that is, is diverting money away from nitrogen and gibberellic acid uh, to invest in some of those things. Um, puts you in a better position long term to capitalise on nitrogen and jib acid as, as tools. So what are they and what do they do? Well, I think most people would know that nitrogen is a self-essential plant building block um, and it increases the rate of dry matter accumulation just by increasing leaf size. So basically what that means is your rest period or your rotation length shouldn't change as a result of adding nitrogen, although I often see that it does because people will be focused on on dry matter accumulation and will go go into paddocks too early just because more more feeds turned up. It's very much like a, a steroid for plants. So if you stick steroids into a human being that's dead, not much happens. It's no different with a plant. If the plant's dead or or it's dormant, then the response is is um, not great, if if anything at all. So. Similarly with jib acid, um, although it's a plant hormone, so basically the plant decreases its production to decrease growth. It wants to decrease growth because resources like nutrients are decreasing and day length is decreasing, so it's just a defence mechanism. We can apply gibberellic acid to trick the plant into thinking that those conditions don't exist and so it'll accumulate additional dry matter as long as there are some nutrient resources there and, and enough sunlight um, by increasing cell size. So years ago when I think um, jib acid came off patent, there was a lot of scepticism. I mean, we've done plenty of plant tests now. There is a real increase in dry matter, so we're not, no longer worried about that. I think the main thing for us is the priority between nitrogen, gibberellic acid use and, and when you go about that. So just in terms of increasing leaf size, this is just two plants um, I pulled out of a paddock last week. Um, the one on the left was just um, in the paddock. No, no nitrogen had been applied to that paddock. I then went over to a urine patch and pulled out uh, another tiller. And the blue arrows are just pointing to the same leaf, one that um, had a heap of nitrogen and one that didn't have so much. You can see that those two plants are at identical leaf stages, but um, the second leaf on the plant with nitrogen is much bigger and, and that's the effect. So just highlighting the point that it's, it's leaf growth um, as a result of nitrogen and gibberellic acid application uh, and rotation or rest period shouldn't change. Um, in terms of just the practical application, so there's heaps and heaps of research on nitrogen. It's, it's something that haps, happens quickly. So researchers and students um, get a result quickly and it doesn't cost too much money. So there's any amount of research out there. It's not so much on gibberellic acid, um, but we've done hundreds and hundreds of, of replicated trials and um, test strips on client farms, and we get a reasonably consistent um, set of results, which allows us to prioritise the two, which we think is important. So from our point of view, when we've got soil temperatures that don't look like they're going to go under five degrees for the winter period, um, we'll always um, preference nitrogen um, as giving us the best chance for the best response. Um, Soil moisture is our critical limitation most of the time. So lots of energy and effort and discussion goes into how much rain we need to wash it in and all those sorts of things. But if you've got a plant that's moisture stress, stress to any extent, 
um, or it's not growing freely, then we'll get a compromised response to nitrogen. And typically that's that's around 50%. Um, and we also have got waterlogged soils, we, we won't get um, a very good response to nitrogen either. So soils that have had a lot of water, but are free draining 48 hours later, go for your life, but, but um, pastures are gonna sit waterlogged for extended period of time. And there's really no use in applying nitrogen. Um, we find with gibberellic acid that if we've got declining soil temperatures and those soil temperatures look like they're gonna go under five degrees for longer than 30 days, that gibberellic is an incredibly powerful tool. Again, we can't have a soil moisture limitation or we'll get the similar reduction in total dry matter yield or response. It typically lasts for 30 days, whereas we find a nitrogen application will typically last for the appropriate rotation based on plant morphology. A um, lot, lot of um, hearsay around it depleting soil nitrogen reserves, but we haven't found that that's the case with reasonably fertile soils. And you know, you need reasonably fertile soils to have the sorts of plant population and plant types that, that you would be bothered applying gib acid on. Um, it requires foliar uptake, so we need you know at least 1,200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare or 60-70% ground cover. Just some other considerations. I think in, in some scenarios, gibberellic acid works best with nitrogen or vice versa. So a lot of the time if we've got declining soil temperatures and we're heading under five degrees um, for 30 days or more, so that's that's you know, 12, 15 days of frosts, um, which many of you will get, um, we'll, we'll apply a combination. So a 50-50 mix of, of nitrogen and, and gibberellic acid. So one to get the plant growing and the other one to, to provide nitrogen, which generally there's not a lot about due to a lack of mineralization in the soil. Um, once we've got an increasing temperature, um, and if we need it, which is often not that common coming out of winter, um, nitrogen will often be a better option. So most of our test strips have said, once we can pick up an increasing soil temperature, um, we, we move away from gibberellic acid and, and back to nitrogen. Um, one of the issues is that a lot of clients in the autumn will, will be um, applying herbicides. So we, we actually have a fixed cost of um, the application of the gib acid and under those scenarios it can compete with nitrogen at temperatures above five degrees. So there's a few things to consider. Um, I don't think we should be talking about them as competitors. We should just say sometimes nitrogen's more appropriate, sometimes gib acid's more appropriate, sometimes a combination of the two is more appropriate. Um, I know many of you most of you probably don't irrigate, but this is the best photo I've got of the impact of um, moisture stress. So literally once um, moisture tension goes past a critical point, plants will trigger dormancy. So if that happens, even if we break that limitation the following day or following week, it's still a plant will still require a serious amount of time like a, often upwards of 30 days to go track into and out of dormancy and back to full growth. <clears throat> so if, if we consider that that process will reduce pasture growth by about 50%, even if we break dormancy quite quickly, then that'll do the same thing to our nitrogen response. So um, for me anyway, if, if I'm in an environment where I know I will ultimately get rain, um, I'm usually more prepared to, to wait for it than worried about getting too sophisticated about looking at weather forecasts and all that. So we'll we'll get a, an autumn breaking rain and then, we, you know, if that's not enough to fill the profile off and wait for the second rain, I'm very comfortable to do that in the knowledge that I, I may be accepting half the response that I could get. Um, and usually soil temperature isn't going to crash that that badly in that in that two to four week period. Um, one of the other limitations is the rest period. So, you know, if we believe that pastures don't grow at a constant rate and they grow in a, a sigmoid curve and we can basically grow, um, divide the, the growth period into three equal segments that 
we'll grow 50% of the available feed in the last 30% of the rotation. So in this graph, the appropriate grazing point is time three. And at that point, time three, we'd expect a 10 to one response, say. So if we reduce the grazing period by 30%, we'll get half the response to nitrogen. And if we reduce it by two thirds, um, we'll get about a 20% response. So the rest period is critical. Um, again, I think a lot of the time people don't have enough feed is because their, their rotations are too short. Their rotations are too short, so they're giving up 50% of the feed. They're then in a position where they need to apply nitrogen and they only get 50% of the response for the nitrogen. So I see that commonly. Um, so I think anyone who's who's in the space of advising you around nitrogen or gibberellic acid application should be talking to you about about rest periods because that along with moisture can compromise the response by 50 to 80 percent. Um, so how do you determine that rest? Well, we use plant morphology. Um, that's just simply observing um, number of leaves on given species. You know, whenever we're applying nitrogen, we're obviously playing a defensive game. We're obviously predicting we haven't got enough feed. Um, so we will want to be out at those maximum leaf stages. Um, if, if you're not familiar with leaf stage, it's simply a case of observing the bottom leaf on the plant. The minute that starts to decay from the tip, um, that plant's re ready to be grazed or that pass is ready to be grazed. You're going to grow another leaf at the expense of one you've already got, so you might as well take that out and repeat the process. Um, this is busy. I hope you can see my cursor, but typically um, we will, you know, across our client base, which extends, you know, from Hobart all the way up to, well, I guess Dubbo, um, this focus around February transitioning into March, fingers crossed for an autumn break, you know, increasing chance of soil moisture, decrease, uh, increasing chance of reduced soil temperature, um, and somewhere in there trying to have a best bet at when we apply and what we apply. Um, so we're continuously trading off there the, the increasing chance of moisture or increasing soil profile against decreasing soil temperature. And the fact that we have those rules of thumb around, you know, heading under five degrees for more than 30 days or a series of frosts and a crashing soil temperature, which will crash quicker with with limited moisture because moisture tends to be a buffer of the soil. Um, we can quickly make a call when the conditions are right, which is non-limiting moisture, around whether it's nitrogen, gibberellic acid, or a combination of the two. Typically, if if we're out by in June and it and it hasn't rained, July still in starts to get an increasing um, soil temperature, we get rainfall. It's then really a call of is the nitrogen that goes on now just going to add to a surplus or you know, have we wound our average cover down so low that we're still going to be able to capitalise on that feed? So there might be smaller amounts of nitrogen over smaller areas at that stage, but once soil temperature is increasing, um, we don't apply gibberellic acid. Um, so just really what we're trying to do here is the red line is basically animal requirement, blue line is normal pasture growth, and then our expectation around one kilogram of nitrogen added per day in the grazing rotation. So if we're on 60 day round, might be 60 units, 45 day rotation, 45 units, is that we will get about a 10 to one response to that. And that, that would allow us to run a mid-winter stocking rate somewhere between three and, and five DSE above where we would otherwise be without the application of nitrogen or gibberellic acid. So if you consider, you know, that most people might be heading through winter at somewhere between five and 15 DSE, to lift that by three to five DSE is highly significant. Um, and the amount of mouth power and potential that gives us into the spring um, is uh, highly significant at a whole of system level and a whole of farm profit level. 
In terms of application rates, um, it's another diminishing returns curve. So there's a point um, where if you go below that amount per hectare or above that amount per hectare, you will compromise um, the response. Um, so there's a bit of debate in the literature. We find if we're between 25 and 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, um, we're, we're not often disappointed um, factoring in the right rest period, the right level of moisture and a call on nitrogen versus jib acid or a combination of the two. So in that space, we'd expect 10 to one response. Um, if we're doing feed budgets and it says, look, we 100 kilograms of dry matter per hectare short across the whole farm, straight away we would know that if we apply 10 kilos of nitrogen per hectare across the whole farm, we're going to get a very low response to that. So maybe as low as three or four kilos of dry matter per kilo of N. So our strategy then is let's lift that to 30% across a third of the farm or 50% uh, 50 kilos across I don't know, half the farm or 20% of the farm. Um, we will look at, you know, obviously heading into winter, the, the other side of that is lambing and calving. So we may well drop the rate back from 50 kilos to 25 kilos, same response rate, but we just get it over a bigger area and get more feed in more paddocks. Um, it, so as to be able to set stock, um, use or, or cows, heifers over calving and lambing. So knowing the response rate and and some of the limitations either side of the optimal range is, is quite a powerful tool in terms of setting up your nitrogen strategy through that period. Um, biomass, so gibberellic acids has to be applied via the foliage. Um, we can do the same with nitrogen. Um, we, we want as little as, as possible to fall on the ground. So, you know, at least 1200 kilograms of dry matter or 70% ground cover um, is the ideal. Um, everything around nitrogen and gibberellic acid on one side has from an agronomic perspective, um, an efficiency level, um, but it's obviously got to be multiplied by the cost. So there's plenty of times when we'll move outside the ideal range in a whole host of these areas because we can still get an economic response. So I've mostly talked about the optimum here, but there's nothing to say you can move to a less efficient position and still get, get a good economic response. So expected responses, and I guess this is about expectation. So I, I try to set them at a reasonable level. Um, I know we can get higher responses to this. We can get massive responses to nitrogen, but it's often when we're already gonna have a surplus of feed anyway. So feed deficits, we generally work on about 10 to one for nitrogen and jib acid and a combination of the two, if that's the preferred option. So you know, at the equivalent of $600 a tonne for, say, urea, $50, pardon me, $50 a tonne application cost, we'll get dry matter at about $150 a tonne or 15 cents a kilogram of dry matter. So, you know, in terms of competing sources, that's, I hate to say the word cheap, but it's, you know, it's the next best thing to growing it without nitrogen. Um, so in terms of using that additional dry matter, like we have to predict a feed deficit. So right at the moment, that's not that hard. Generally, as we head into winter and we're coming into spring and for a lot of us, we're looking at buying in trade stock and the quicker we can get them in, the better, or we're looking at lambing or looking at calving. We know um, that we're gonna eat more feed than we can grow in the next 90 to 120 days. Um, but it's about, you know, the best or most economic return and that's not always simple. It can be quite complex uh, and there's risk involved. But I, I think <clears throat> certainly when I model this stuff um, at a profit level, if, if we can feed animals that are already going to be there better to either finish more quickly or achieve higher weight gains and we've got the cost of maintenance of that animal already covered, then we get a very high return. Um, like I said before, if we can lift mid-winter stocking rate to drive spring stocking rate to lift average annual stocking rate, that's 
increasing use of homegrown feed, number one driver of profit, so that's a very high return as well. Um, body condition score targets, like a high to good return, so that does vary a lot between cattle enterprises and sheep enterprises and even within sheep in enterprises around prime land production or wool production, but a, a good to high return. Um, increasing body condition to take it off later, that's a good return. I mean, it's it's probably $150 a tonne that we put it on at and we pull it back at 80% efficiency. So, you know, that's around $190 a tonne or 19 20 cents a kilo of dry matter. So still highly effective in a as a supplementary feed in a feed deficit period. Um, a lot of the time we will be on target heading into winter and I've got plenty of clients that will put a bit more on to feed animals a bit better and feel better. Well, like I think it, it doesn't have a great return, but by geez, it's nice to do um, the odd autumn and winter and early spring period a little bit easier now and again. Um, I guess for me, we can always eat it. We never waste it. Um, I don't like a, applying nitrogen to create a surplus and then conserve it. I think, you know, by the time we've paid $150 a tonne to create it, another $100 a tonne to mow rake bale and get it into a pit or wrap it. Um, and then we decrease the energy by 20% through the ensiling process and we waste 20 percent at feed out that we're about $400 a tonne. So I'm thinking grain's probably a better option. It's easier to feed um, and we probably get higher utilisation. So I'm not a big fan of applying nitrogen to, to generate surpluses. Um, withholding periods, you know, around nitrate poisoning, a lot of people have concerns around that. I, th I think there's only really two methods. It's either timing days or around plant morphology. Timing days, most of the literature that, that I can find says that day 14, you're, you're roughly going to be at peak. Um, and so by day 30, it's it's dropped off again. It's converted a lot of that to protein and that plant's reasonably safe in inverted commas. Plant morphology, we, we actually have very, very few problems. I've got plenty of clients that will apply nitrogen over the whole farm on one day and just continue to graze as normal and, and generally won't have any problems. Um, there, there are some exceptions around annual pastures and some of the weeds and cereals. So, you know, I'm saying take agronomic advice from, from your local provider um, and just be aware of some of those exceptions. Uh, effect on clovers and legumes. So this is not so much about the winter period, but a you know, major concern of a lot of people is that nitrogen has some sort of detrimental effect on, on legumes. So, in my experience, it just gives the grass a competitive edge. And, you know, if you allow that to shade legumes, they hate being shaded and that kills them really quickly. Um, but if you apply nitrogen and you're heading towards canopy closure, that is when when no light at all is getting to the, the base of the pastures, then we should defoliate anyway. Um, and if that's occurring before the appropriate leaf stage, then you could ask why did you apply the, the nitrogen anyway? Um, so it's not a perfect world that that stuff happens, but you know if you if you're canopying out at too early uh, and you're driving that with nitrogen, then it's probably a cost you you don't need. Um, jib acid, you know, sub and white clover, effectively they're pretty unresponsive. Certainly through the winter period, a lot of those plants are heading for dormancy. They're well protected even against shading. If in fact we can make that that occur through the winter. Um, so some of the likely returns, like this is like my rough as guts approach. I'd, I'd say work with your local consultants around this um, for your own, own system or, or even throw some numbers on the back of an en envelope yourself. Um, it varies very much by farm. It varies very much if you're at the highly operational level versus whole of systems level, but just as an example, I you know I worked out earlier that six hundred dollars a ton for urea, seventy uh, fifty dollars a ton to spread it, uh, four hundred and sixty kilos of N at a ten to one response will give us food at about fifteen cents per kilogram of dry matter. So if I've got a steer that's putting on five hundred grams a day, um, I, over that ninety day period I can get forty five kilos on. But more importantly. Um, if that's a 400 odd kilo steer, 
it'll require about 50 megs or five kilos of dry matter just to maintain itself and another four kilos of dry matter per kilogram of live weight gain. So these are just my rough rules of thumb. Um, so basically it's going to take two days at 500 grams a day to do its kilo of live weight gain. So in those two days, it'll leak in two lots of five kilograms a day to maintain itself and two kilos extra each day to do the live weight production. So a total of 14 kilograms. If I said a kilo of live weight was worth four bucks and 14 kilograms of nitrogen induced dry matter um, at 15 cents is, is $2.10, then you know my margin over feed costs, and I know this is not all the variable cost, but it's a hundred percent return. So, you know, it's a pretty attractive proposition um, at, at current beef prices and current um, nitrogen prices and likely responses. So, you know, if your response is five to one, you, your cost's going to be, you know, double that. So you're effectively doing it for the fun of it. Um, the other side of that is if we were going to hold those cattle anyway, so there's no other market, or we just do extra live weight, then the the cost of maintenance is fixed. So at the margin, it's four kilograms of dry matter to do a kilogram of live weight. So margin over feed cost is $3.40. So that's a 400% return on capital. And if we, even if we doubled the cost of that feed, so we only achieved half the response, then we still got a, a pretty reasonable margin. Um, at the systems level, so around increasing mid winter stocking rate, it'll be higher than that. So we, we've got the whole system going at a higher level. So if you can achieve that in conjunction with extra live weight gain, um, then it has, has a really, really nice return. But again, um, if you've got limitations in your system that are driving the requirement for nitrogen, um, you then got a dependency based model and, and literally there's not very much return at all. Um, competing alternatives, so basically nitrogen jib acid, it, it gives us feed at about 15 cents a kilo or $150 a tonne. Adjustment, it, look, if we're at $1.20, $1.40 a day and they're getting eight to 10 kilograms of dry matter a day, it'll be 18 cents a kilo, $180 a tonne. There's no wastage in either of those um, because we're working on the amount eaten. Um, if we buy hay and silage, then we've got the cost of the feed and wastage. So we're going from about one cent to up to two cents per megajoule of energy, then up to 23 cents, 20, uh, 2.6 cents, sorry, and same for grain. So um, nitrogen gibberellic acid, when you can eat them and when you can replace other sources of feed are quite cheap alternatives. Um, so I guess I spoke a little bit earlier about efficiency versus effectiveness. So, you know, if you went if you went back into the drought and you, you had a small amount of irrigation or, or a storm event or something and you thought, well, I've got 30 days of growth, it'd be nice to have 60, but I could throw nitrogen in that and create feed at, you know, $300 a tonne. Um, you'd be pretty hefty. Uh, happy as opposed to paying five or six hundred dollars a ton during a drought for for grain. So th there's definitely occasions when you can look at compromised responses or taking a hit on efficiency and still be effective and still get an economic return. So again, it's worth just working through those those calculations. So just to summarize, um, I think um, Right at the, the, the very top of the tree is the whole of systems spend uh, and make sure that you're not in a position where um, you need nitrogen because you've uh, misinvested early or nitrogen isn't being diverted away from long term higher returns to patch up short term problems or drive short term returns at the expense of those higher long term um, returns. Um, Nitrogen and gibberellic acid, again, like just a tool, and they can produce good value feed, um, even cheap feed, uh, if used appropriately. I, I think what's critical for me is that response function and that it is a function of, of soil moisture, the rest period, 
the fixed costs that are in the system and soil temperature. So you need to be factoring those in before you're going to have a debate about the merits of nitrogen, dube acid or a combination of the two. Um, and given that everyone's farm's a bit different, you know, you can all be doing different things and all be doing the right thing. Um, but we'd, we'd like to move that into the fear of si field of science rather than opinion. Um, it won't impact on legume content or legume productivity if if um, well managed and your defoliation intervals right. Um, I think it's critical to analyse the response at the margin um, and to consider both efficiency, which you know will often debate ad nauseum, but but effectiveness is what we're really about. It's like multiplying that by cost and looking at return to see if it's economically worth doing. Uh, and I think if you waste nitrogen induced feed, well, it's it's got an incredibly high cost, like bringing any cost into a system that you can't capture a benefit out ultimately isn't good for the system. So that's me. I'm happy to, to take questions. Okay, okay, so, so Basil, can you uh, Questions for when we talk about the pastures having a rest period, it's sort of a very human term. I normally translate to many regrowth period, where we're just allowing our growth to get into the stock again, it might mean taking them out or lowering our stocking rate. But do you think that's fair? that a rest period for pastures that could be waiting for rainfall, but it's sort of recharging or regrowth. Um, sorry, can you just re-ask the question? So it was more of a comment that when we talk about resting pastures, we're talking about regrowth opportunities. So unless we're waiting for rainfall. Yeah. The term resting gets used a lot, but um, it's normally sort of got to be an effective rest because we're allowing for regrowth. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it is. Absolutely is. So I can't see any questions yet. I'll just remind our attendees that if they want to click on the question mark up on their top right of the screen and type something in, um, now that Basil's finished, we're happy to take questions from anyone. I don't know if they're struggling with the technology or just you've covered it all comprehensively and no one's got any questions. Um, what about the season? You and I were chatting earlier that um, we could readdress this at the beginning of, of spring when temperatures, soil temperatures are warming up, if it looks like we're going to have a good spring. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I had some people today from the area um, send through, they'd had 20, 25 mils, 20 to 25 mils, so that, that's an opportunity. But I think, I think definitely, there's a dilemma in there for us consistently around June, July when we we get an opportunity to apply it, but are we just adding to the spring surplus um, and trying to work out a best bet a, approach to that? So again, like we're pretty, um, I, I guess, regimented around a whole feed budgeting approach. No matter, and I, I think frequency trumps accuracy in that space. So just knowing you're going to be short is is a very strong position to be in around applying or spending money in that space and I always think the cheaper feed appears to be or, or can be generated for the more you've got to think about it and the longer the lead time so again you know if we get into a position sort of june july and we're starting to get serious rainfall and soil temperatures are warming up <laughs> we get quite enthusiastic enthusiastic about the opportunity to apply stuff but the reality is we may may not need it and I think that's part of right if we don't need it and we can get away without it and we can divert funds back to ticking some of those whole of systems boxes then that's always going to be a better spend in my mind mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so right at the beginning, you spoke about buying you out of trouble. And um, I was just wondering if you could think of a good example, because I guess I interpreted buying you out of trouble as when you've got a mismatch between feed on offer and stock numbers. Is there a better example of when someone's considering this to buy themselves out of trouble? Um, that's a good one because it's all encompassing and it is the root of all trouble in in grazing systems. But I, th I think the one for me is like when we've got reasonable conditions, if you end up on too fast a rotation, you're compromising total growth by 50% and then you're putting on nitrogen to catch up and you're compromising the response to that by 50%, then that's that's a huge impact on business profitability where you know you've made a hole and then you build the hole inefficiently and it would be worse still if you took a d stock option at current prices to to marry the two lines back up again okay so i've got a question from um from alec now do plants sprayed with um jib acid have the same quality of feed without the jib acid applied yes they do there's just less of it yep same with same with applying nitrogen with the exception of it can elevate protein levels a bit okay um is alec happy with that answer you're welcome to um query it again so the same quality of feed quality is not compromised but you're saying the quantity will be? Uh, the quantity will be increased, yeah. With yeah, Jibbit. sorry, I thought you said less of it, but yeah, there'll be same quality and increased quantity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could I get you to elaborate a little bit more on the leaf stage when you were talking about grazing again and you mentioned the leaf tip could i just get you to repeat that when the leaf tip of the oldest leaf was dead yeah so i think now there's there's literature on pretty much every improved pasture species around the appropriate leaf stage window for grazing um <clears throat> But if you're not familiar with it, basically it's saying that most plants will hold a certain number of leaves before they'll grow another one and, and resume nutrient or kill the bottom leaf off. So we just lose production. So if you're not familiar with it, you can basically check pastures that you're, that you're resting and you're just looking for the bottom leaf, which is the oldest leaf from the tip to start yellowing off or dying, and that's as much feed as you're going to accumulate in that paddock. It's just a way of determining that right rest. I think for me, um, you know, a lot of nitrogen goes on, a lot of jib acid goes on. It gets a response anywhere from going green to a massive accumulation of feed. And the difference is basically if, if water's non-limiting, just the rest period being right. So I think anyone who's helping you from an agronomic point of view around applying nitrogen um, should be having a discussion with you about the rest period. And I think for me, that has to be linked to morphology because that'll give us the most quantity. It'll give us the best quality of feed and we'll still get, you know, daughter tiller production and survival. So it's kind of, optimizing the response on three fronts to the nitrogen um, rather than just that one quantity front mm -hmm. yeah um, i'm sure we could talk longer about the impacts of shading but what sort of dynamic um, when um, you've got serious shading events going on um, in terms of percentage of clover that you can say lose in a season, which as you were pointing out, uh, don't necessarily blame the clover. Um, don't necessarily blame the nitrogen. It's actually the grass is shading the clover that's that's causing that 
clover drop off or is it more the seeding capacity of the clover it's going to reduce your seeding if it's shaded yeah well it, it will do both um around the timing of that um and whether you you're talking about an annual legume or a perennial legume but there's, there's not a lot of work done on it it's most, mostly on white clover and i think bill fulkerson has done most of the work that i'm familiar with and it's it's around you can lose 50 percent um in terms of the mass plant population sorry i'm not sure what that does to the yield for the balance of the system i mean i, I suspect that grass will make up some of the difference because they're competing for light but if you if you're precious about legumes in in pastures which i am um i, I like the the legume to be in there i like to preserve it and i don't like to give a competitive advantage to the grass in and to get rid of the legume i want the best of both worlds which i think you can have with the right defoliation interval so even if you get it a bit wrong with a bit too much nitrogen you should be coming in a bit earlier and taking out once you start to shade your legumes okay there's another question there now um if nitrogen soil tests are adequate will you still get a short-term response from extra nitrogen um yeah so I, I don't even look at the nitrogen um level in the soil um there, there's been a lot of work done by R richard eckhart um you know around lag periods and all that and look um for me i'm i'm a really strong feed budgeter and i look at nitrogen as a supplement not as a fertilizer so i'm the whole time checking my feed budget going look i'm i'm short of feed uh, i've got good conditions for a plant to res or a pasture to respond to nitrogen i'm putting nitrogen on um by the time i can get a soil sample done and get it to a lab and get it back again that's all done and dusted so so for me it's about um working out whether i need feed whether i've got conditions where plants will respond which which will be a function of of soil nitrogen but it just doesn't happen quick enough for me to get a result back and then do something about it so i generally don't worry too much about it um from an look i'm not an agronomist so from an agronomic point of view ag agronomists will be able to comment on the value of doing soil tests to, to look at nitrogen levels and how that might come about yeah. as a function of a whole heap of other things but I'm, I'm i'm really short term on that stuff i'd have to say that if i had high organic matter in a paddock or um high nitrogen maybe not me medium levels but high nitrogen levels on a soil test at the beginning of the season then with um rainfall I would be more confident that I was going to get mineralization events if the temperature of the soil was right. So sort of going into early to mid autumn or, or going into spring, um, but less so when temperatures were colder um, or if I didn't have those high levels in the first place. So I'd need to be feeling quite confident about that nitrogen soil test and also how many cores were taken, how repeatable it would be that I would actually get a response from a mineralization event. Yes, I think that would be that would absolutely turn up in a feed budget. What whatever whatever amount was there to be mineralized, whatever conditions um, suited or otherwise mineralization and freeing up of it and a plant response to it would flow through more quickly in a feed budget than any other um way you could possibly monitor that in my experience and then it's a case of that efficiency versus effectiveness so we can actually have quite low le levels of mineralization but enough soil temperature to get a really good response to nitrogen so yeah i, I think that what you're describing absolutely happens um but the way we measure it is just through the feed budget so you know we're either using a satellite or we're using some form of measurement which could include an eyeball to to work out whether we're short or in surplus of feed and then we're addressing that with if we're short with nitrogen if we've got the right conditions 
Yeah, and the timing of the rainfall we just had, like if we'd had an event like last night where you'd got 12, 16 or 24 mils, I would have been confident about the uptake of the, the nitrogen with that sort of rainfall. But as we know, if those sort of very low events that come through, it's always been questionable whether the nitrogen was going to have good uptake if you, you're sort of getting less than five. Yeah, that's well, look, I I think if you've got a good soil profile full of water, little events are great. If if you haven't, then they're just a waste of time. It, you know, if you're not going to get at least 30 or 40 days of growth on a perennial pasture, then you're really going to battle to get an economic response to nitrogen. So a lot of the time my clients, they get super focused on rain events coming and if it's like to say five to 15, even 20 mils, it's like that once it gets up to 20, 25 mils, the poor old fertilizer spreader guy is getting his phones ringing off the hook, but it, it doesn't make a big difference to me. Well, like we, I mean, we've got seven farms of our own there that I'm happy to wait till the second rainfall event or a good first rainfall event, and then dues um, are fine to get it onto the soil surface. Um, I think we're over focused on on the amount of rain versus how full our profile is like really need to take a cropping approach almost to how much growth we're going to get out of the perennial pasture and then or annual pasture for that matter and and then look at whether we have a best bet on the nitrogen or not okay there's another question there uh is there any issue with overall soil health with consistent application of ga and or urea so no. I guess you could interpret that in a couple of different ways, but in other words, are we impacting our overall soil health by using inputs like gibberellic acid and urea? No. So I, I would say that the bulk of the science, and I, like I can forward some um, some links through, the bulk of the science is suggesting that with, you know, reasonable, up to 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, which is, is not a lot really, um, there's an improvement in soil health. So basically those bugs feed on dry matter. The more dry matter you accumulate on top of the ground, the more you accumulate under the ground. And so the bulk of the science is saying we get increased populations of, of soil mi microbes with the addition of the right amount of fertilizers. So, you know, all the good science will say, use the soil sufficiency level to determine your PK, S, and pH levels, address those, use nitrogen to generate additional feed when you've got probably a lack of mineralisation, and that's all good for, for soil health. And, yeah. and I think any of the stuff around what those bugs are, whether they're, you know, protozoans or bacteria and all that, I, I as far as I can read, and I read a lot about it because I've got a lot of interest from clients in that space, I can find no good science in that space. Okay, I think I'd also say that, um, you know, balance is always good and agronomists are all trained in the law of the sort of limiting factor and what that means with soil fertility. But just because you're focused on macronutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, or potassium, um, you know, don't forget to check um, your sulfur levels with changing fertilizer practices that I, I do see low sulfur levels and I do think we need to emphasize that our trace elements are important sometimes it's worth keeping an eye on any toxicities or deficiencies and being responsive to that and open to that so molybdenum fertilizer is still important as a trace element and there's, there's others so there should be some balance in the equation just because you're focused on generating feed opportunities doesn't mean you forget about the little stuff. Yeah, so I think anything macro or micro that's important for for plant production, we we address under that sufficiency approach. And anything that an animal needs and a plant doesn't, we go straight to the animal. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'm not sure if there's any more questions. Um, you've certainly answered mine. Uh, one last call for other questions. 
happy to still take them. It's five to nine and we can we can keep going. Or Basil, do you have any other reflections to share on the topic? Um, no, not really, just that it's, you know, for me, it's just a tool. I'm not really pro or, or otherwise. I, I just, I think too much effort goes into whether it's good or bad rather than just is it the appropriate tool for for the occasion, but but I I just reiterate that I do see dependency um, develop sometimes out of short term solutions to problems that possibly people don't need to have. I have got a client who reckons the only thing he needs to get through winter is nicotine and nitrogen. Hmm. Um. Yeah, well, hopefully for his health, he might give one of them up, but... Um, Nitrogen, I reckon. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, I don't really don't want to get political. I don't normally need to worry about that with agronomy. I think you're being provocative now, but um, look, I hope everyone's got something out of the discussion tonight. Thank you all for your attendance. Um, Basil's going to be our guest speaker on a couple more um, webinars in coming weeks. So thank you very much and good evening to everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending.